All right, we left off with the uh, 51 Islamic countries that are standing today, uh, Islamic republics. Now let's go on to Daniel chapter 8. Now once again, uh, the medo persian the Greek uh, kingdoms, and the Babylonian empires and all that, that's kind of old news now, so we're going to skip the first eight verses, which has the ram with the two horns and the uh, the goat of Alexander the Great and the four horns of his generals. And so we're going to go now to verse 9. Chapter 8, verse 9. <clears throat> Out of one of them, one of the horns, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south and towards the east and towards the glorious land. The glorious land would be Israel. It grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars that threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Remember, this is all happening as a as a, the Lord releasing Satan up in kingdom, and uh, uh, Satan now possessing the Antichrist, and also a war in the heavenlies, and Satan being cast out, and all that. So there's a lot going on um, in in the in the heavenlies. Verse 11, <clears throat> it became great, it being the Antichrist, even as great as the prince of the host. Now, who is that? The prince of the host is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus Christ call Satan? The prince of this world, okay? And the regular burnt offering, so it's telling us now we've got a temple and sacrificial offerings being made. Well, that was taken away from him. So now we got the burnt offering taken away from the third temple. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And then verse 12, it says, And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. So uh, an easier to understand rendition is because of their sins, the Jewish people and their temple will be given over to the Antichrist. Let's read on, verse 13. <clears throat> then I heard a holy one speaking and another one holy one said to the one who spoke. Okay, when there, we hear an angel asking another angel a question, who's going to give this angel an answer? It's not for the angel's sake. It's for our sake, okay? And the question is, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot. And he answered, and he said to me, for 2,300 evening and mornings, so for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. Okay, so actually the the answer added a fourth criteria. So we got from the time of the reestablishment of the temple, its sacrifices to the abomination of desolation, which happens in the middle of the 70th seven. And then all the way till the temple is restored again by Messiah. That time is 2,300 days. So when Whenever a decision is made and, and you see on the news of a third temple being built in Jerusalem, um, let the reader be aware. Uh, we have started the clock of 2,300 days. Now, something else that is also very important here is the context of all this. And the context is that this is given to Daniel. In Daniel's day, there was no temple. Uh, quite likely, Daniel's parents probably witnessed the destruction of the temple in 586 B.C. So a lot of this might have been quite confusing to Daniel. Um, 
And then another thing to keep in mind is that so many theologians out there, they insist that this was all fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, he was a bad dude. Uh, he did some bad things. He set himself up in the, in the temple as well. Uh, but Antiochus Epiphanes is nothing more than a type, a foreshadow of what's to come. If it was true, if it was all fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, like what the preterists uh, proclaim, then um, why would Jesus refer to Daniel for an end time event if it had already been totally fulfilled 200 years before he was even crucified? That makes no sense. So who are we going to believe, the, theolog the, uh, the, the theologians or the Son of God? Hmm, let me think of that. I think I know my answer. Uh, also, let's go back to Scripture because it's going to be explained in verse 17. The vision is for the time of the end. So let's read on. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Ulai, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near me where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. The end is the eschaton, when it's all over, when Jesus Christ sets up his millennial kingdom. This vision is all about the time of the end. Now, I got Gabriel, asterisk, and a couple of verses in Luke, and all that is just to point out is that it's Gabriel that has been right there through the whole process of the first coming of Jesus Christ, all right, God with us, Emmanuel, uh, the appearance to uh, uh, Mary and Joseph, which uh, is the Luke's uh, responses here. So it's no surprise that Gabriel is also involved with this vision because this vision concerns the Messiah, his first and his second comings. Let's read on. <clears throat> Verse 18, and when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up. He said, behold, I will make known to you what shall be the latter end of the ignition. Okay, the great apostasy, uh, the great tribulation. Um, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Once again, this is talking about the end of days. And as for the ram you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat that you saw is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken in place of which four others arose, that being the four generals taking over Alexander the Great's uh, kingdom, Four kingdoms shall rise from this nation, but not with his power. So they were not as great as Alexander the Great. Verse 23, and at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, so in other words, um, the sins of man and mankind have reached its fullness, there will be a king of bold face, arrogant, the Antichrist, one who understands riddles shall arise. He will be very wise and cunning and sneaky. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. So just like what we started in Revelation 6 with the four seals, the four apocalyptic horsemen, guess, remember, they were all given power. Guess what? The Antichrist was given power. This is not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty man and the people, the elect, who are the saints. 
um, those that hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. He's going to elevate himself up as God. And without warning, he shall destroy many. This is the reason why when Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken of by the prophet Daniel, run, run to the hills, run to the wilderness. And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. He shall, so he thinks, will be a contemporary, a counterpart to the almighty Messiah. And or I should say, but he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The word of the Lord. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now. So Daniel, this is way beyond your horizon. So just seal it up. The day will come that others will understand what's going on with these prophecies. And that's Daniel 8. So, <clears throat> without further ado, let's go to Daniel 9. Now, I'm going to kind of go through this fast because we've already done Daniel 9 in an earlier uh, presentation. But as a review, Daniel 9. The 77 starts in verse 24 where the, uh, the angel says, 77s are decreed for your people, the Jewish people, and your holy city, Daniel, that being Jerusalem. And then he lists off six amazing things that just line up perfectly with the new covenant. To finish transgression, man's rebellion, revolt against God, to put an end to sin, to put an end in to sin. Powerful and amazing. God's kingdom, I can't wait. To atone for wickedness, shall I say once and for all, to bring in everlasting righteousness, not for a season, everlasting. To seal up vision and prophecy, so this is gonna be until the end, and the end is just that, it's the end. We're gonna read about it also in the book of Revelation and to anoint the most holy place, his temple. So we'll read on, verse 25. No one understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which was Artaxerxes' decree, March 5th, 444 BC, found in Nehemiah, until the anointed one, the Messiah, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens or 49 years and 434 years, which equals 483 years. Now, I wanna just explain something real quick because sevens can mean days, hours, months, years, but in the Hebrew culture, Years were measured by sevens, just like weeks were measured by sevens, as opposed to Western culture where we still measure weeks by sevens, so one week, two weeks, three weeks, but we measure uh, years in units of tens, one decade, two decades, three decades, 10 decades, 100 years. So all that adds up to March 30th, 33 AD which, by the way, most theologians believe that is the day that Jesus Christ rode into town on a colt, on a donkey, uh, in preparation for the Passover and his crucifixion. Now, it being Jerusalem, the temple will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, which we can vouch for, uh, what we read in the Gospels. After the 62 sevens, 434 years, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing as prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53. Jesus 
was crucified, very likely, the theologians have done the math, on April 3rd, 33 A.D. And then we read verse 26b. Actually, we're, I'm breaking it up. Verse 26 is a long verse. It's got three very important sentences. Well, the middle one is the juggernaut, shall we say, the Roman theory. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's NIV. ESV says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So we got ruler, prince, uh, and the people of that will destroy the city and the sanctuary. This one sentence is the most significant source for the Roman Antichrist theory and the theory that uh, the fourth kingdom is Rome, which as we've seen so already, it doesn't fit, fit any of that criteria. So theologically, we would read this sentence as the people, that being the primary followers of the ruler of the prince from whom will arise the Antichrist, because there's a type and foreshadow and a in time fulfillment, who are to come in the last days, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, which happened historically in 70 AD and eschatologically uh, during the last three and a half years of time as we know it, of the last seven. Therefore, if the people are Romans, it's believed that the Antichrist will be European from a Roman heritage. So that's you know, an area that we need to look at very closely. However, if the people are Islamic, like the Islamic Caliphate, like the Ottoman Empire, like all these Islamic states uh, that, by the way, hate the Jews, hate Israel, want to destroy God's people, and, and by an extension, uh, they're not really tolerating the church. They hate the church as well. Okay, if they're Islamic, it's believed that the Antichrist will be Middle Eastern from a revised Islamic caliphate. So there's a lot of things that, uh, that are determined by this one verse and whether it's Rome or the Islamic caliphate. So let's dissect the verse. <clears throat> First of all, who are the people? Because that's the biggie here. The people, the people, are they Romans? Or are they, or are they Muslims? Are they Arabs? Are they Syrians? Who, who are the people? Okay, we need to go back to the original language. Remember, it's the original language that is the, um, the absolute truth, okay? The inspired scripture. Um, so, the original language, the Hebrew word is am. Okay, I'm going to give you two quotes. One from a very famous Hebrew uh, lexicographer, Wilhelm Gesenius. I don't know if I did the German proper. But anyway, this is what he says about am. It concerns single races or tribes. It concerns race or family the kindred, relatives. Now the golden standard uh, for the Hebrew language is the theological workbook of the Old Testament. And this is what they say. Well, am um, predominantly is used to express two basic characteristics of men considered as a group. So we got men considered as a group. And one, the relationships sustained within these men, within this group, or, to, or two, the unity of this of the group. So is this group united in their in their ways, in their beliefs? So therefore, the people that we're looking for is we're looking for either a race or we're looking for an ethnic group, such as Muslims. Okay? What about the ruler? So we've already kind of determined who the 
So what to look for or for the people? What about the ruler himself, who's going to come uh, and you know has in the past destroyed the city and the sanctuary in seventy A.D. Well, that Hebrew word is nagid. The Strong's uh, definition is a commander as occupying the, the front. Uh, and it could be civil, it could be military, or it could be religious. Uh, going back to the theological workbook of the Old Testament, it says, well, this is applied to leaders in several fields. It could be governmental, it could be military, it could be religious. The word is usually singular and, and refers to the man at the top. So we'd say commander in chief, the king, the high priest, However, there are references to leaders and captains in the army. Okay, so now we've got definition and we look at context and we can come up with what it re really means. So in the context of 70 AD, destruction of the temple, we're not looking at the kingdom ruler, but to a commanding officer, in this case, General Titus and the race or the ethnic group that was under his command. Okay, so the naysayers would say, well, wait a minute, General Titus, he's a Roman general. So why are we arguing this? It's Rome, get over it, it's Rome. Well, there's more to it, sorry. Okay, first and foremost, what was the race or the ethnic group that was under General Titus? These legions of soldiers, because we had the general, we had commanding officers that were Italian, but we had thousands, tens of thousands of soldiers. Okay, I'm going to give you two references. One, I'll probably butcher his name, from Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Tac Tacitus. Anyway, this dude was a senator and historian uh, in the Roman Empire. And he writes, and I quote, Titus Caesar, Caesar found in Judea three legions, the fifth, the 10th, and the 15th. And now to these legions, he added the 12th from Syria and some men belonging to the 18th and the third, whom he had withdrawn from Alexandria in Egypt. Okay, Egyptians. This force was accompanied, quote, by a strong contingent of Arabs who hated the Jews with the usual hatred of neighbors. So the usual hatred of neighbors already includes everybody that's been listed in these legions. From Titus Flavius Josephus, Vespasian sent his son Titus, who came by land into where? Into Syria, where he gathered together the Roman forces. So, I mean, these are all soldiers for, um, that were either drafted or for hire. With a considerable number of auxiliaries from the kings in that neighborhood. So we're talking Syria and all the neighboring countries around Syria, which, oh, by the way, they hate the Jews. Malchus also, that's the king of Arabia, sent a thousand horsemen besides 5,000 footmen, the greatest part of which were the archers, so that the whole army, including the auxiliaries sent by the kings, as well as horsemen and footmen, when all were united together, amounted to 60,000 soldiers. Wow. <clears throat> okay, so we kind of established now who the workforce, the real workforce was behind the legions, the soldiers, the foot soldiers. They were not Italian. They were not European. They were Middle Eastern and probably primary from Assyria. And all that, now we got about 60,000 of them. Now, who ordered the destruction of the temple? Because it doesn't matter if Caesar ordered the destruction. It doesn't matter if General Titus ordered the destruction because then that points straight to Rome. This is all Rome. And we need to expect uh, a Roman Antichrist 
and we need to get over it and just say Rome and Empire was the fourth kingdom. But let's go to history. Let's go to historical records from Josephus, the War of the Jews, where he writes, <clears throat> quote, and now a certain person came running to Titus, so that's the general, and told him of this fire, whereupon he, Titus, rose up in great haste, and as he was, he ran to the holy house in order to, to have a stop put to the fire. And after him followed all of his commanders, so those would be Italians, and after them followed the several legions in great astonishment. And then did Caesar both by calling to the soldiers that were fighting with a loud voice and by giving a signal to them with his right hand, probably waving like an Italian, ordering them to quench the fire, to put it out. Titus, supposing what the fact was that the house itself might yet be saved, he came in haste and endeavored to persuade the soldiers to quench the fire, put it out. Yet were their passions too hard for the regards they had for Caesar and, they, and the dread they had of him who forbade them, as was their hatred of the Jews. That was a bigger motivator. And a certain vehement inclination to fight them, the Jews, too hard for them also. And thus was the holy house burnt down without Caesar's approbation. So who was behind the destruction of the temple? It wasn't Rome. It wasn't General Titus. It was the Arabs and the Syrians uh, that were the foot soldiers that hated Israel and the Hebrew people with a passion. And we will see that same hatred is what's going to motivate the Antichrist. So let's read on. <clears throat> the people of the ruler who will come, the Antichrist will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So historically, that happened in 70 AD under Titus. Uh, but um, from an end time perspective, expect a military Islamic Jihad, and very possibly uh, it will involve a lot of, shall we say, people that came from the ancient nation of Assyria. And we read that in Isaiah 10, starting verse 20, in that day. Well, we know what that day now means when it's, when it's uh, proclaimed in the Old Testament. In that day, the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him, being the Antichrist, who struck them. But now what? They will lean on the Lord, on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, I'll insert the word regrettably, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed from the throne room of God himself, overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of all the earth. So we're definitely talking about end times. Verse 24, therefore thus says the Lord God of hosts, O oh, my people who dwell in Zion, be not afraid of what? Of the Assyrians when they strike with the rod and lift up their staff against you as the Egyptians did. For in a very little while, my fury will come to an end and my anger will be directed to their destruction. Okay, <clears throat> we'll finish up Daniel chapter 9, the third part of verse 26. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. 
he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So that will be the abomination of desolation. And at the temple, the third temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on them, on him, as in the seven bowls of God's wrath. Okay, the NIV says he will confirm a covenant. Other translations will say a strong or it will establish a strong covenant. But I think confirm a covenant might be the most accurate. And let me explain. Um, Islam has purposely denied any existence of any historical evidence of any Jewish connection to the Temple Mount. They just refuse to recognize or acknowledge that any such records or artifacts exist. And let me quote two big dudes on the uh, Islamic world side. One comes from the former Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, <clears throat> where he is quoted saying, Muslims have no knowledge or awareness that the Temple Mount has any sanctity for Jews. Why are the Jews interested in Temple Mount? Now, this is a quote from the former Chief Justice of the Religious Court of Palestine and Chairman of the Islamic Christian, the Islamic Christian Council for Jerusalem and the Holy Place. So this is the spokesman for it. Quote, Jews have no connection to Jerusalem. I don't know of any Jewish holy sites in it. Israel has been excavating since 1967 in search of remains of their temple or their, shall I say, fictitious Jewish history. Wow. And as we know, uh, there's been a lot of excavation at the, the Temple Mount, at the Dome of Rock, and they've been purposely destroying any artifact that they find. So, therefore, as is spoken in Daniel, he will confirm a covenant could very well be a calculated recognition of an existing covenant, God's covenant with the Jewish people concerning Israel, Jerusalem, Mount Zion, Temple Mount. And it could go something like, you know what? We recognize that God chose you, made a covenant with you, and gave you Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, and we will let you build. Of which, what will Israel say? They will agree without any second thoughts. Okay, so that finishes up Daniel chapter nine. We'll have to do <clears throat> 10, 11, 12 at a later date. 10, 11, 12 are all one vision, but they're vitally important to understanding, uh, the, uh, complete, a more complete understanding of Revelation. So let's look at some current things that are going on that, are, uh, that we see today, uh, mainly in use. First and foremost, we see two flags of Islam. There's a white flag and there's a black flag. Well, what's that all about? Well, uh, unless you understand Arabic, uh, we don't know what's written on them. And on both flags in Arabic it's written, there is no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his messenger. So already we see hence that what these flags represent will be unnegotiable. There's no God but Allah. And we plan to establish that truth, quote unquote, throughout the world. Okay, one is white. <clears throat> the white flag, Aliwa, serves as a sign for the leader of the Muslim army and is the flag of the Islamic 
state. So it's a governmental flag. And here's just some recent examples. Uh, the top left is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Taliban mocking the United States, uh, acting, uh, reenacting a uh, Iwo Jima uh, raising of the flag, but with their own, the Al Liwa flag. Okay, what about the black flag? The black flag is called the Arraya and is used by the Muslim army and it's a military flag. And by the way, what you see in the bottom left corner is the burning of two flags. So you got the uh, American flag that's kind of draped over the uh, Israel flag, the blue and white. So why am I bringing this up and what's the relevance in all this? Well, let's read on. I'm going to give you some Islamic quotes concerning these black flags. And, and I could give you their names, and they're like a mile long. Maybe I'll put them in the handout notes. But first one, the messenger of Allah said, the black banners that you're seeing will come from the east, and their hearts will be as firm as iron. Interesting choice of word, because we just talked about a kingdom that's going to be strong as iron. Whoever hears of them should join them and give allegiance, even if it means crawling across the snow. So this is a very strong statement and command. Another quote. Hadith indicate that black flags coming from the area of Khorasan will signify the appearance of the Mahdi is nigh. Khorasan is in today's Iran. And some scholars have said that this hadith means that when the black flags appear from Central Asia, that being the stands, uh, states, um, everything from Turkmenistan to Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, um, Kazakhstan, um, anyway, in the direction of Khorasan, then the appearance of the Mahdi is imminent. One thing that maybe many of us don't know is that uh, Islamic uh, faith has an eschatology that's very similar to what we read in the Bible. Let's call it a maybe a copycat parallel. Mahdi is Islam's Messiah and is believed to be a future Muslim leader of the whole world, not just the Muslim world, but the whole world. One other quote, Rasulullah Muhammad said, armies carrying black flags will come from Khorasan, once again, from the east. No power will be able to stop them and they will finally reach Ila Baitul Makdas in Jerusalem, where they will erect their black flags. So what is Batul Makdas? It's Arabic and it means the holy house and it's referring to the Dome of the Rock Mosque located on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That's their campaign to conquer Jerusalem and Israel and the plant their flags on top of the Temple Mount. Okay, uh, coming from the stand states and from the east, uh, just to help us see this um, on a map, uh, there you have it. So we have uh, Israel, which is about right there. And coming from the east, well, uh, you see um, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, a little bit to the north would be Turkey, uh, Syria, need I say more. And so while we have black flags being carried in the east by the Muslims, well, we kind of have some black flags of our own in the west. I don't think it, I need to, do, to really uh, add any more to that other than a picture says a thousand words, okay? From pretty much two mainstream uh, forces that we're very aware of. Now let's move on. 
because there's something else going on in the world that I think we need to capture attention to, and that is President Erdogan, Erdogan, I'm sorry, President Erdogan, who is the president of Turkey, has this vision, this uh, desire to reestablish the Ottoman Empire, to reestablish and lead the Islamic Caliphate. Okay? Um, is he the Antichrist? No, I don't think so. Could he be one of the Antichrist, plural, prior to? Quite possibly, yes. Uh, but this is something that uh, has been ongoing, and uh, watch that space. That's all I can say. Something else that has happened recently, and uh, this is, uh, well, we had this last Passover. The Passover sacrifice, uh, there was a dry run by Levitical priests under the guidance of the Sanhedrin near the Temple Mount. And guess what? They were able to do it, and police were able to even, they were warming up to the idea of this happening. Uh, and what they got permission was to do it. What they did not get permission was to actually do the sacrifice. No, not the sacrifice. To actually do the slaughtering of the lamb on site. They had to do it off site and then take the blood and the carcass uh, to uh, this location near the Temple Mount and perform the ceremony. Uh, one thing in this story that caught my attention is Passover sacrifice, a requirement today, and this is right out of the story. The importance of the reenactment was underscored last week when Rabbi Aryeh Stern, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, ruled that the Korban Passach, the Passover sacrifice, is incumbent upon the Jews, Jewish people, even in current times, even in the absence of a temple structure or lacking a red heifer to purify Israel, though the sacrifice may only be performed on the Temple Mount. So the, one th the other thing that caught my attention here is the ashes of the red heifer. And this is a, a very interesting requirement that's uh, laid out in Leviticus. We're not going to go get into it other than to say this. They're saying we're lacking it. So what did the Sanhedrin do? They put out a full page ad in all these magazines read by, uh, by ranchers around the world. Hunt for the red heifer. Add your herd to the hunt. And then there's a, a, a web page where you can click on and submit any candidates. And there's a, there's a prize. I forgot how many thousands of dollars is, is for one that is pure. So uh, in other words, it has to be 100% red, no white or black hairs. There's got to be no scars, no tags on the ears, no wounds, no tattoos, no blemishes of any kind. Okay? and never been haltered. In other words, the animal has never been uh, forced into anything that would be interpreted as work. Well, guess what? This year, they found one. And this is two uh, rabbis from the Sanhedrin inspecting and uh, recording this red heifer that in their eyes is perfect. And this heifer is going to be transported to Israel next year. So there's a lot going on and a lot that we need to keep our eyes on. Remember, Revelation is Middle East centric. That's the theater. It's focused on Israel. It's focused on Jerusalem. It's focused on the, on the Hebrew nation. And it's focused on Mount Zion, the Temple Mount and the future temple. So with that, we will stop and um, more to come.